Hey guys, how's it going? Jason Sensational here. Welcome back to the channel. So for today's video, I wanted to do another set review where I review all the newest cards coming out in the World Ender set this Wednesday. For you guys, that should be tomorrow. And this will I will rate all 69 cards, haha, nice, with a one of five star rating, just to, you know, kind of test my ability to kind of gauge some of these cards. Um I, I do have the there should be a uh a little legend at the top if you ever want a reference to it but just to quickly glance over it, a one star is a unplayable pack filler two stars a funny build around you know between one and two stars i'm not super you know like <clears throat> i'm not gonna be super critical about it if it's like a funny haha kind of funny play around card um you know two so i'll be pretty generous about it so that that's not like really like too too important um but onto three stars it's solid card maybe like just a neat or like a niche tech option um but doesn't like fit into like any like tier one kind of things and then four stars tier one meta deck staple and then five stars which is a card that is so powerful it defines its own kind of archetype or empowers an existing deck to higher levels and so i'll try to use those pretty loosely you might have half stars in there um it sometimes doesn't fully make sense but we'll just try to run with it and see how it goes but nonetheless, we have like six, nine cards out there. So a lot to cover. <laughs> Let's jump right into it. So for the first two cards here, we actually have some interesting kind of support cards. And outside of like the three main champions that I have showcased in on the channel already, they have slotted in some random like support cards for some other archetypes. These two cards specifically more focused towards Vladimir, especially, you know, you can tell by the card art itself, right? But starting with the first card, we have Crimson Pigeon, which is a one mana two to Noxus. Has a support that says deal one to my supported ally to grant me plus one plus one. Now, uh, we can look at this card in two different ways, right? It's a one drop in Noxus, right? And if we want to think about it in an aggressive term, because this can have the potential to be a one mana 3-3, three, three, well, we have to all of a sudden compare it to a lot of the other one drops in Noxus, which it's competing for, right? We have Legion Rearguard, the 3-2, we have Precious Pet, the 2-1 Fearsome, and we have Legion Savitar, the 2-1 that has the ability to deal one, right? And while this has the most stats and can block, um, it does come with a condition, right? A lot of times this is just a 1 mana 2-2, two, two, especially if you're attacking on odds. You place on turn 1, you just have a 2-2, two, two, right? You don't have the ability to support anything. And if you do support something, that unit you support also needs to have, well, more than 1 health. Because if you're killing off the unit that you're supporting, that's not really slotting into the aggro archetype that you want to have, right? Um, and I think this card's just a little bit too conditional to be aggressive in the terms of where most decks just want to like jam 1-1-1 one, 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 um, and then kind of like swing. This doesn't really fit in unless you have some like high high rolls like Crimson Pigeon into Crimson Pigeon into like Legion Rearguard. And then at best you have like a 3-3, three, 3-2, three, three, and a 3-1. That doesn't seem that great, especially because they don't have keywords. Um, and that has to have a lot, that has to have a lot of conditions, right? You can't like play Precious Pet, you can't play Legion Rearguard and then support with the Crimson Pigeon. So in that sense, this card really only fits into what I think is its purpose, and that's more towards this sort of Vladimir sort of self-damage archetype. And even then, like you have to you have to like play this on one into uh you know like a two drop that benefits from it, and that's definitely very limited. Um, and I don't really see this card being all that great. You definitely have a lot more better options, like especially spells, to kind of give this sort of damage your own ally thing, right? And it's only granting this plus one plus one. I don't think this card is super powerful. Um, and I don't know. I don't think it's super beneficial for the archetype that it falls under either. I might give this like a 1.5 stars because the archetype itself is not good. I don't see this card making that archetype better. So I'm going to give it 1.5 stars. <laughs> Next up, we have Reveler's Feast. This is a 3-mana burst speed card. This is deal 2 to an ally to give allies plus 2 plus 0 this round. And I think this one's definitely a lot more interesting than Crimson Pigeon um, because A, it's a spell that you can play at burst speed. It's a combat trick where you can like buff up multiple units, and it's buffing their attack and all units, right? Um, this card is actually quite, to me, it's quite comparable to a card like Vision, where it's three mana, and it gives, it, granted, Vision is a grant card, this is only a give, and Vision can be discarded for free, right, to get the same effect. 
Now, uh, because the existence of Vision exists, um, this card in comparison, it, it, I don't think it would fit into like the same aggressive decks again, right? For the same reason that A, if you're playing a discard deck, you have Vision. B, um, if you're playing a super aggressive deck, you have Brothers Bond, which is a grant and it doesn't have the condition of dealing damage to an ally. So aggressive decks can use this a lot better because generally speaking, their units have very little health. Again, and then this is also a give, not a grant. So it's hard, right? Because if you look at this card, you already have, if you're playing the self damage archetype with Vladimir, you can look at a card like Scar Grounds and then, oh, I'm just gonna play something like Ice Shard, right? And then all of a sudden that's dealing one to my opponent's units and also dealing one to my units which in turn gives them plus one attack essentially doing a sort of similar thing while also being permanent right this sort of just temporary buff uh, is doesn't really seem that great it really relies on this deal two to an ally to actually be an upside right and that's just really not all that great so i i'm gonna put this out of one point sorry five stars again just because i don't think these cards are actually flexible enough to be put into other decks i think there are much better options for these cards in other sort of noxious aggressive archetypes and i don't think that these cards are really reviving their sort of archetype that are putting in all right next up we got rise and his five rune shards and this is the one that i'm definitely the most sort of unsure about i i revealed this, i reviewed this whole set on day one when it was released and now i've had a chance to actually look at the trailers and i you know actually read the cards so now i'm a little bit more aware of the mechanics and entirely what they do and but this one is definitely the one that i think is the hardest to grasp without really trying it out and seeing where the meta slots right the Rise is this OTK kind of a champion. I would highly recommend you check you check the champion videos, champion related videos on my channel in the past week if you want to look more closely into these champions. So I won't dive too deep into these, but I'll just kind of talk about the, what they do, right? So his origin, first of all, if his origin creates two delve in the past in the deck. I'm assuming if you're playing Rise, you're playing a all in Rise deck. So you start with six delve in the past in your deck. Um, when you sum when you summon rise, you create two more on round star, you create two more. So let's say you have 10 delve in the past by turn five, right? Now you only have six starting in your deck. And at the start of your game, I would assume this happens before you it, it's unclear if this happens before your mulligan, because if it happens before your mulligan, that's quite important, right? Um so A, not sure about that. But if you can mulligan for your delve in the past, that is obviously a lot better because now you're at least potentially starting with one or two in your hand, which didn't or which cuts down the mana you need to spend to find those cards, right? But overall, you need to play five delve in the past and then play out all five world runes, which is a lot of mana, especially for the first one or two. Now, once you get to like four or five, well, now your rise is activating them. Um, they're activating all the other world runes that you've played. And then you're getting a decent amount of value, right? You have one that deals two to the weakest, one that refills two spell mana, which is probably one of the best ones considering delve in the past is two spell mana. Art of Hope heals Rise and your Nexus 2. You have this one that creates a Steel Tempest in hand and discounts its cost. Essentially, Rune Prison is just a Steel Tempest. And then you have Shard of Violence that draws one, right? So I think that once you like once you get to level two Rise, which is you need three World Runes, I think you have a decent engine. But depending on how this works, if you're not able to Mulligan for Delve in the past. I f really feel like this is going to be super slow. And not to mention there's some decent interaction that your opponent can do to stop your rise combo, right? So, it's tough. I uh, there's, there, there's a certain power level to the card just because it says that it can end the game, right? This is the kind of deck that if you look at an archetype like infinite, you know, this is going to fall in the same slot where it's going to absolutely dominate any deck that can't end games. Rise has spell shield um on himself so he has some inherent protection to him right and i feel like just he, he's super polarizing but i don't see him being fast enough 
to really sort of counteract some of the faster decks right now. Um, so I just don't, I think he's just a solid three star card. I think he's the most interesting card by a mile, but I just don't think he's fast enough. And it'll really depend on A, the meta, and then B, how refined decks can become to see how fast you can pull this off. Uh, and that's just really what it comes down to. So I'm going to give Rise three stars for now. He, uh, he will either surprise me or meet my expectations. And that's the hope that I give for him. Uh, Rise of Spell is a draw three. Um, discards any followers drawn. And just as a quick <clears throat> sort of, I guess, just afterthought, uh, his origin allows you to put any non-targeted burst and focus spells into your deck. So you can run cards like I'm not gonna borrow, you can run all the Telstones, you can run like <clears throat> some some sort of draw slash predict cards. But Rise overall, he's super interesting to me, but I just don't really know how to evaluate him right now. So I'm gonna give him three stars. All right, on to Aatrox. Aatrox is the second champion. We have a six mana five five that gains plus one plus one and region off his blade, and he creates a world ender in hand. Now, originally, I sort of underrated, or I definitely underrated Aatrox because I didn't understand how he worked properly. First things first, when it says you've played world ender. Um, even if World Ender gets denied, Aatrox still levels up. I think that's the most important thing given the changes to the play versus cast change, right? So that's number one. Aatrox level up can't be denied. It can get really ruined because this World Ender card is actually really good. For example, if your opponent kills Aatrox, you can put the Darkened Blade onto any other unit, and then World Ender turns that unit into Aatrox, which is the one interaction that I think I definitely underrated, because this World Ender effect I think is absolutely insane. This card by itself is potentially game-winning, and even if it only like brings Aatrox back, I think that's also pretty good because Aatrox becomes this engine where not only is he a 6 mana 9 9 overwhelm with region, well, he makes his Darkened Allies cost 5 less, right? And I, I think he's like, I feel like this is not like this is really good, right? It's on level to Nautilus, right? Where Nautilus has that overwhelming pressure. If you can't kill him, well, he's going to end the game, right? The benefit of Aatrox is that, uh, at least compared to Nautilus, is that his level one form is actually pretty decent, right? You have a six mana six six with a region, so he's actually able to chump block and get some effect value out of it and also sort of force your opponent to kind of deal with him, right? And then even if they deal with him, you can put the Darkened Blade on something else, and then you still have World Ender, right? Um, so, I mean, that could be really annoying if you're just like playing this on like a Spell Shield unit, and then your opponent doesn't have Deny, right? Because if they can't kill the unit with the Darkened Blade on, well, you're just going to get Aatrox back from for, for, for this mana, right? I do think this card is, the, or at least the power level of World Ender is definitely a reliance on how much you can discount this card and how many darkened allies or equipped allies you have with darkened weapons on board because if this is really only bring back aatrox well that's really expensive but if, if this is giving you like one or two darkens i think that value is really really good right because if you're transforming your whole board into like a leveled aatrox and then like uh, two darkens that cost like eight man or whatever like that's enough to win the game on its own and this is definitely something you can play by turn eight, hopefully, right? Like you play Aatrox on turn six, you spend turn six, seven, maybe eight, getting some strikes. And then all of a sudden you can play this card and sort of have like this game and game winning button, right? So Aatrox, and I guess we'll cover as well as his origin, it allows you to put any non-champion Darken into your deck during deck building. And this is actually a lot more limited because this doesn't include the cultist cards. This only includes the nine Darken weapons, right? Um, so he definitely has a much more limited pool of cards. You can't play the cultist cards like Unforgiving Cold. You can't play uh, Expanse's Protection if you're not playing like either Varus or Kane, right? So you uh, you do lose out on a lot of good cards. You lose out the one mana two one predict. 
um, and you lose out on Unforgiving Cold. So Aatrox's card pool is definitely a lot weaker, and he limits your ability to... Your secondary region has to have units that you feel comfortable with equipping the darkened weapons onto. And that's his major restriction in deck building. I think he's strong on paper, but I think when it comes to his deck building restrictions and his you know effectiveness to kind of get the darkens equipped i think is going to be the biggest challenge and the biggest reason why or if aatrox should slot in your deck versus a card like varus or kane right because the cultist cards have been really powerful proven again and again aatrox doesn't get access to those he does get the darkens but he has this extra limitation to him right you have to be able to play world ender um, and you have to get a decent amount of value out of it, right? And I think that's where Aatrox has the highest level of weakness to me. But I think overall he's still a solid card, right? His spell is this triple striker that goes 3-2-1. Um, and it has some decent actual interaction, right? Now it is his chance spell, and you can't actually play the cultist strike card. So again, you're limiting yourself to the interaction of whatever region, secondary region you're in. Um, so I think there are certain restrictions that Aatrox has that a champion like Varus has a lot less of, but I think he has the potential to be much more swingier in terms of power level. So I want to give Aatrox a 3.5, maybe a 4. I don't, this doesn't seem as strong to me as a card like Vayne or Seraphine that we've gotten. And compared to Varus, well, it's hard to say because their restrictions are so much more different, right? So I will give Aatrox a 3.5, maybe leaning 4 on his, on him, and I guess, you know, World Ender, Death Sweep, Darken Blade, this whole like shebang package. All right, next up we have Darken Spear. This is the Freljord Darken. It's a two mana zero plus two equipment in Freljord. Um, gr attack, grant the top two allies in your deck plus one plus one. You may spend eight mana to play me as Anako. So this is Omen Hawk on a stick. Giving plus two health, I think, is actually really solid. Uh, Freljord cards already have pretty decent sort of stats or keywords. You have like the Tusk Raider. Or Ruthless Raider, sorry, the 3 1 with tough and overwhelm. If you give that plus 2 health, well, that's actually pretty good. And this is like the only weapon that gives plus 2 health, right? At least when it comes to darkened weapons. Um, so I think this is like pretty solid, except for the darkened halberd, but that like has to kill a unit, right? That's slightly different. But this seems okay. If you spend 8 mana, you can play as Anaka, which attack from the top 6 of your cards, summon an attacking follower or non-champion Darken, and grants a plus 1, plus 1. So this is sort of like, you know, if you look at, like, Protective Broodfather, where it draws you a unit if it's a dragon, summon it attacking. It has a sort of same effect to it, but it's a lot less conditional. Um, and it could be pretty okay, right? Uh, this does only summon followers or non-champion darkens, but it also means that, you know, if you draw, uh, if or if your next card is another darkened spear, for example, this is going to summon out the spear as Anaka, right? Which is super, super insane. Like, this has super high high rolls, especially if you hit darkens, which might be really good for Aatrox, right? Because if you can play World Ender to assimilate this into... Anaka, and then if you're overloading your deck with uh, Darken weapons, you can pull out another Darken, and then like you cheat out like 8-9 mana, right? Like This has really good potential, um, especially in Aatrox decks, and even outside of that, like this sort of like mid-range mid -range, uh, Relgard archetype could definitely see this as high value right because it's giving these omen hawks turn after turn and i think also very importantly it gives you a weapon to enable unforgiving cold because uh, what each region that doesn't have a darkened weapon has this problem right where you have to fulfill the equip requirement we have to play something like a four drop a three drop maybe some sub substandard units to kind of achieve that right 
and having a darkened weapon that can be good in the early game and then can be great in the late game is super good right so i'm going to give darkened seer a four stars i think this is a fantastic design has super good interactions with aatrox and even within Froyard midrange i think this can be a very fantastic card all right wooly snail moth six mana six six empowered eight region so empowered is if it has eight attack it gains region um sorry as long as it has eight attack this has region if it goes back to six attack well you don't get region anymore is at least how i understand it if i'm wrong well i look like an idiot but six mana six six overwhelm and the potential of region i don't think this card is good um Mm. like i i compare this card to like what mammoth shaman and mammoth shaman is like just better i guess or like there's also like the auger of the old ones like uh, this overall region kind of thing especially for like six mana is just not good right you have much better plays you can just like blaze side duani um this takes up the six mana slot it's too slow it's too bad it doesn't win you the game there's better cards out there this is going to be a one star card Wild Mysticism, 5 mana, slow speed, gain, get an empty mana crystal, summon a Feral Mystic. And Feral Mystic is the 2-2 two, two Overwhelm that on Enlightened is a 6-6. Six, six. And I think this card is actually really, really good. Or at least it's good if you're running ramp, right? Because you easily, you, when you see this card, you usually compare it to Catalyst of Aeons, right? Which is a burst spell that does the same thing, but instead of summoning a unit, it heals you 3 health. And when it comes to this card most of the time, when you're playing Catalyst of Aeons, it doesn't actually matter, at least for most instances, whether or not it's burst or not. Granted, the healing sometimes matters, um, but outside of that, you just don't really care, right? You want a card that you can play on 3, you know, sometimes it's your opponent's attack on three, they pass, they force you to play Callus of Aeons, then they attack, right? Then all of a sudden, the healing and the fact that it's burst is sort of irrelevant. Whereas you play this card, sometimes you don't need the healing at all, and then you get a Feral Mystic, which can block. If you are already enlightened and you don't need the healing, you just get a free 6-6, six, six, right, with Overwhelm. Like, this is a very fantastic card, because a lot of times you don't care about the healing, and you don't care about the ramp. I mean, and you don't care about the speed. And then you get a blocker, which almost serves the same purpose as the healing. And you have an upside to this card if you're already capped out on mana gems, right? It's just a summon a 6-6 six, six overall. So for the car for the decks that run Catalyst, this is a fantastic upgrade to that. Um, it's just that there's not a lot of decks that run Catalyst. So <clears throat> I think this is a great card. I think this is a three fantastic three-star card. Howdy Poro, 1 mana, 1 1 Poro, Empowered 3, Overwhelm, Region, and Tough. Now that's, now that's a Poro, huh? Now, it's actually, it's a lot easier to empower Poros. You have cards like Poro Snacks, and if you do meet the requirements, gaining Overwhelm, Region, and Tough is a lot better than, you know, this Wooly Snail Moth. Um, Froyer does have some decent buffs to it. Mm, and you can even like omen hawk or like revna you have a lot of stat buffs in this region right now you wouldn't want to play this card in any deck though right if you play as a one mana one one on turn one that's not it i just don't know if you actually main this that card main card main main deck this card in any deck is my issue um because i think it's just like too much of a build a bear kind of thing if you're really focused on it It'd be great to generate this card off of some of the cards that create Poros in a Poro deck, but I don't really see this card being sort of main deck. I think it'd be hilarious, um, so I'll give it a two-star card, because you can enable really silly things with this, right? But I just don't think it's very good, so I'll give this card two-star. Here to help, two mana burst speed for all your card, give an ally plus O plus three this round. If it's damaged, give it plus two plus three instead. And these are gives, right? So off the bat, it's a two mana twin disciplines for health. And if it's damaged, it's almost like a take card for three, right? My issue with this card is it seems good, right? Because it's 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 twin discipline. But you're in Froyard, which has which is the region that has, if not the best defensive buffs in the game. Um, you have Troll Chant, which is better than this card because it can potentially give you two value trays, which is a lot better, right? And 
in, if you have this condition, it only gives the stats for turn. I would rather just pay one extra mana to play Take Heart, right? I just think this card is so inadequate compared to everything else that Freud has that I don't really see this card being played. Now it is two mana, so cards like Seraphine, it's, it's going to the Seraphine pool. Seraphine would love to hit this card. But if you're running this in Froyard, I think you have better options. So I am going to give this a one star rating. I just don't think it's good. Wow. And it's, it's weird to like be so harsh on this card, but I really, really just think there are a lot better options. We already covered Naka, Dark and Spear. All right. Puzzling Signpost, four mana, Bandal City card, return a fast or slow spell to hand or destroy units' equipment, and then draw one. So it's pseudo deny, right? You're essentially denying the card for a turn, but you're not getting rid of the card, right? So they can cast it again. Now, most of the times, that really just doesn't matter. Because oftentimes you're winning on that turn, right? If especially if you're denying something like a ruination or like a harrowing or like whatever, right? If you're denying something big enough, that one swing is good enough where they're not going to survive another turn to be able to play it again. And I th uh, and it comes with a draw one, right? Like this is so good for some aggressive archetypes. It's just fantastic, right? Like, <laughs> uh. I just, and this card's really good. That's all I can say. It's, it's deny. Sometimes better, sometimes worse. Obviously, you know, you're not the luxury of like being on a nopify thing. So it's not better than being an Ionia for deny or spells. But a lot of the times if you're just denying something like uh, just any sort of spell. And like, imagine you're d denying a deny, for example, hypothetically. Like, they can't re-deny it just because it doesn't go back to the hand until the stack collapses, right? So, this serves most purposes of a deny, especially for faster archetypes, and also has a draw one attached to it, which, I mean, <laughs> god damn, dude. Like, it's so good. I, I think this is easily a 4.5 star card. I just don't really know if the decks that can run this card need this card, but I don't because like it is super conditional, right? Now, granted, I think you can always just cycle this as a four mana draw one, regardless of whether or not you meet these conditions. But the fact that it's a, a deny, b it flexible enough to destroy units' equipment, which can be very important. You've seen cards like Quietus do this, and because it's conditional. I mean, because it's so flexible and has draw one on it, like you can just do it for destroying units equipment, even if you don't need it for deny. So I think this card is super flexible, super high upsides for a lot of different aggressive and even slower decks. I will give this a, I will give this a 4.5 star rating. Next up, Poro Stories, two mana build or Bandle City spurt spell burst speed create three one cost Poros in hand. It's really interesting that they gave it to Banal City, but this card's interesting. Well, I think for a lot of Poro decks out there, they don't really want to be main decking a lot of just like, you know, dinky Poros. Like they play Lonely Poro because, well, it gives you a second Poro. They play Poro Cannon because it gives you two Poros, right? You want to be drawing Poro cards that give you extra Poros. You don't want to be playing like a, you know, one mana, one, one Poro in your deck. Well, the ability to have this card generate you three Poros is not bad value, right? Especially if you are playing that Poro Snacks, um, Fabled Poro kind of deck, right? The issue with that is you do have to run in in Bandle City, so you are losing out on Poro Cannon, which historically has been one of the most high rolling cards with, uh, you know, Poro decks. So it's, it's like a give and take, right? You're losing your elusive poros for the chance at creating extra poros. And I really don't think that's like very, it, it's hard, right? Like if you could be playing poro can instead, you have Aurora Porealis if you need some extra refill, but that also gives you poro snacks. And I just don't know. It's hard, man. Like I just don't think there's enough reason to be in Battle City to sort of want to be playing this card with poros, right? Again, it's two mana, Seraphine pool, you generate three chump blockers, that's pretty solid. But otherwise, I think this is just a two-star card. Um, I just don't really see this Bandle City Poros, or like Bandle City Freljord Poros being good. And especially if you're running this card, you have to be playing Poros Snack deck. And I just don't really see the payoff for this region combination. 
Next up, Darken Staff, the Battle City Darken. This is a one mana weapon, doesn't give any stats, but it has impact as well as strike refilling one spell mana, which is insane, right? It's essentially a free weapon and also has impact, which can push extra damage. So if you're putting this on something like Auction, for example, right? You're refunding your mana, you're getting in your quick attack, you're getting in your impact. So all, just off the bat, I think that's super good as far as weapons go. Um, it, 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 it gives you all your weapon synergies. You can put this on the Blooming Cultist, which is, and, and then makes it elusive. It's a 3-2 elusive with impact that refills the spell mana. Like, that's really good. Granted, it is strike and not attack. So comparing this card to the uh, rod is not fully accurate. And if they can stop the strike, then you don't get the mana back. But otherwise, like, even just base form, I think super good. If you play, spend 8 mana, you can play as Balcux, which is an 8 mana 7 9 impact. When you spend spell mana, grant me impact for every spell mana you spend. So this card comes down as a 7 9 with one impact. On the turn you play it, it's likely only going to have one impact. Maybe if you spank 3 spell mana, it has like 4 impact, right? And if you have a spell to play. If this card like survives a second turn, it's going to get a lot of impact and can potentially end the game, right? The cool thing about this card, like Harazi, right? Where if you get two attacks off of it, you're probably winning the game. But the immediate impact is a lot less. It doesn't have spell shield. Harazi does a lot more. And this card doesn't really fit the bill, right? But because I think Darken Staff is so strong by itself, I think like having like a slightly weaker Darken is sort of acceptable. And of course, the, you know, the reason why the Darkens are so good is that they're flexible. You can play them early on and then, you know, maybe run out of cards to play and then you just slap an 8 mana 7 9 because you have nothing better to do. And then sometimes that wins the game, right? So Balcux itself, I think, is worse than most of the Darkens we have seen. But I think Darken Staff makes up for it. So I'm going to give this a 4 star card. This is a 4 star. Curious Changelings 3 mana 2 4 Battle City unit. When an allied follower transforms into another unit, transform me into an exact copy of it. Now this card is really interesting, right? Because this can sort of cheat itself out because it transforms into an exact copy of it. This can also block because it is a 2-4 stat line, so it can take a chump block, and then you transform something on turns 4 and 5, it sort of regains that health, right? Like, this card has high potential. I saw something really funny where if you assimilate... Um, like say you like assimilate Aatrox's blade, right? And then you you get a level two Aatrox through the spell, and then this card can change into Aatrox. I think that would be super hilarious. Like there's super high potential for this card, right? Um, the issue is that wow, those are very nice niche pipe dreams. And the card itself, maybe you play it into like a teeny dactyl, and then you can activate the teeny dactyl. Like th that's pretty okay. Like, you can curve this card pretty well. You have Teeny Dact on 4. Uh, Teeny Dact on 4. Um, you have Shady Character Potential on 4 as well. You have some, like, really hilarious options that you can use this card for. And it can be pretty good. It has higher swings. And it has a decent style line by itself. Um, it, it's just super niche in the deck that it wants to go into, right? So, uh, the card itself seems okay. Um, but we have like Chief Nakatok, which I think is just going to be better, more consistent for the archetype. So I don't see this card. It competes with Chief Nakatok. The Transformer archetype doesn't really. This is this isn't gonna like take out the trans or take the transformation archetype out somewhere. But I think this card's like okay, right? I'll give it a two point five stars. Darken fan Ionian Darken, and I believe the last Darken we're getting is a two mana plus one weapon. In Ionian, that says attack, summon, and attacking Dragonling. You may spend me. You may spend nine mana to play me as Pra the Breachwalker. Let's talk about the card itself. I mean, I think this effect is strong, right? So you're summoning an attacking Dragonling, which is a the two one ephemeral. So this slots into ephemeral decks, uh, like the Zed Zed deck, right? You're automatically summoning attacking Dragonling, which is an ephemeral, and then that summons your Shark Chariots. So there is that synergy. And even for other Ionia decks, that some of them actually struggle to really proc flow, right? So y y there's a lot, it's, it's like, haha, just play, you know, just play uh, Eye of the Dragon. And Eye of the Dragon can be used defensively as well. But a lot of Ionia decks can struggle to really activate flow. And I think that this is actually going to be a solid option to just give you some extra stabilization 
for a lot of decks, right? I, I look at like most of my Yasuo decks that I make. I realistically am not proccing flow. And if you can just attach this onto a card like Yasuo, for example, well, he already has quick attack, so you don't have to worry about sending him out into combat. And then on attack, you can heal for two health. Like, I think this is a really good upside to this weapon. And of course, it activates momentous choice. It activates any sort of equip a weapon kind of thing. And that's all the whole upside of having darkens in your region, right? Like, I think this card's really good. Um, and then Pra, the Breachwalker, is a 9 mana Darken. It is a 5 4. And then play when I transform, summon two ephemeral copies of me, grant one life, steal one challenger, and me elusive. So you're, so you're getting a 5 4 elusive, and then you're getting a 5 4 ephemeral with life, steal, and a 5 4 ephemeral with challenger. You're getting 15 12 worth of stats, and you're getting three bodies in one action, right? And of course, you're getting like life, steal, you're getting challenger, and the main one's elusive. Like, that's just so much value. And I, again, like, one of the main factors of Darkens were sometimes you have nothing better to do. And then you can just play this equipment that you played maybe, like, two times on the early game as the, the, the Darken form. And that's just so insane, right? This is, like, golden sisters plus more. Like, this is so insane, right? I think this is a fantastic card. I, I, what I, I think this is one of the better Darkens maybe like i don't know how much i would far road rank it but definitely a very very solid card i'm gonna give this 4.5 star navori long tail three mana three one when i'm summoned summon a navori brigand or give other allies plus one plus one this round navori brigand is a one two so you can think of this card very similarly to petty officer right in Buildwater, um where it summons a random one drop from your, re from your regions i think is that even true maybe it just summons a random one drop but this has the same effect, or it can give other allies plus one, plus one this round, which is very, very strong, right? Especially for this cost of three mana. Um, like, I think Ionia can really capitalize on this stuff, right? They have, like, the three, the, the Navori, the, the two, one elusive, right? That can scale plus two attack if you play this for summons, or you can just give your whole board plus one, plus one. Very, very good in elusive aggro decks. Very good card overall for the archetypes i just uh, the archetypes themselves have been super good i think about a deck like timo zoe and i don't i don't i don't see them slotting in ionia um but comparing this card to like other sort of effects that you know do this thing you have like what keep of the masks but that only gives attack you have like windfair hashing but that costs seven you have sign in but that costs six a very a lot cheaper for the kind of board buff and it can just be used defensively would you play this card just to get chump blockers? That's interesting. Like, this card might be good enough just as two chump blockers. Because I only lacks a lot of, like, decent three drops. Like, this card could be okay. Just to sort of stall you into, like, turns four or five. This card might not be bad. It, I could see this card being utilized both ways. So I'll give it 3.5 stars. This card's not bad. When, when technique, 4 mana, slow speed Ionian spell, pick a follower, summon an exact ephemeral copy of it. If it is an enemy, stun it. Oh, this card is hilarious. I remember the first time I saw this card. Let's talk about this card, right? Um, this card is very interesting because it, it, when, you, when you look at this card, you think of Concussive Palm, right? You can stun an op opponent unit and you summon a 3-2. Now you can summon units that are much better than a 3 2. You can summon, you can like copy your opponent's pro the breachwalker, right? It has such high potential, but at the same time, it also has the ability to just be useless, right? Um, it, because it doesn't have the same flexibility as Palm to be able to be played at fast speed, right? And so when it comes down to this card, you have to be able to pick your own follower to get Valley out of it. And then sometimes it has the upside to be used aggressively to stun and summon one of your opponent's units, right? But when you're putting this card into your deck, I really think that you need to fulfill the first part before you can even think about the second part. And I just don't think any deck realistically has that standard. Like, if you're summoning an exact copy of your own unit, you know, maybe you just play, maybe you just play Godwill a season. 
that can summon two copies of a unit, right? Or maybe you just play this card, Black Flame, which captures one of your allies and then you can summon it for the first time that you attack each round, right? Like this card's only good if you can fulfill the first part and then high roll against your opponent, right? Which I think is too niche of a card. So I'm going to give this two stars. But speaking of the Black Flame, a two mana landmark in Ionia, play capture an ally when you attack for the first time each round, summon an ephemeral copy of it attacking. Throughout the bat, I think this is just better than twin win technique. But the issue again with this card is that you're an Ionia deck that has to capture one of your allies, right? Like your planes on turn two capturing a one drop, there's realistically not a lot of value getting out of this card. And the later you go on, obviously you'll get more value out of it, but that means you also have a dead card in hand until you find that ally you want to capture, right? So unless you're capturing something like, you know, like a shark chair, that could be pretty good. And then just getting infinite copies of that. Like there's some really good high rolls to this card, but you have to be able to set it up and you have to not have this card be dead in your hand for too long, right? I think it's a very powerful kind of effect. Um, again, it works with ephemerals. You know, you're automatically getting an attacking ephemeral as long as you have a unit attacking, which I think is good for ephemeral archetypes. And if your opponent blows this up, well, you're going to get the ally back and you're going to get another summon off of it, right? So it has a lot of upsides to it. It can be very snowbally, but again, it falls under the same problem with twin win technique where you do need to use it on your own ally. And sometimes that can be too late. Sometimes you don't draw the card or sometimes you draw this card, but you don't draw the ally you want to capture. And then it doesn't really do all that much, right? So I think this has high potential, but I think it's just a little bit too niche. I'll give it a... What I give this? Did I give this a two star? I'll give this a 2.5, maybe a three if it impresses me. Next up, Encore, two mana, burst speed in PNZ. Create a random two new two cost spell in hand. Reduce its cost by two and grant it fleeting. So very comparable to a card like uh, the the two mana uh, the uh, road to discover the um I don't know what's the name. It's the uh you know the two mana card that creates a, a random two cost card and give it zero this turn, right? So this creates a spell, so it doesn't actually create units, but it is fleeting, right? So there are two mana spells that you can't actually play, so sometimes you don't get value off of it. But for a Seraphine deck, this is actually pretty good, right? Because it's giving you a spell. It's a spell itself, so it's two spells essentially. And you can just like potentially high roll because the pull of two, two cost spells is so, so sick, right? Um, Trail of Evans, there we go. Now, the Targon, I actually, the Trail of Evans was played very fringely in some of like the Targon decks because you could get like the big cat out. But outside of that, I don't really see this card being main decked in many Seraphine decks. If you hit this card off of Seraphine, well, you can just like, haha, you know, you get a free sort of spell off of it. Um, or if you hit it off of anything else, it's essentially a reroll, right? So this card is good in the two mana spell pool, but itself, I don't think it's very good. I'm going to give this a one star rating. Next up, Acoustician, three mana, two, three in P and Z. Strike, create a random two new two cost spell in hand. Ooh, I think this card is actually a trap because it's understated. It has a strike effect and or, and it needs a strike, right? It doesn't do it on summon. It does it on strike. You're running into quietus. It's understated, low tempo. And overall, I think this is quite expensive. Like if you wanted this effect, I think there are better version, or I think there are better ways of doing it, and I don't even think you need to do it right. Like if you wanted to play the weapon to like that creates like a new co new two cost spell in hand, granted it creates a fleeting one, you would do that, but you don't. So I don't really see why you would play this card either. So I will give this a. I don't think it's like terrible. You might be able to, able to experiment with it, but I think you have so much better options. I'll give it a one point five stars. Next up, Cunning Kitten, 2 mana, 2-3. Two, oh, it's a 2-3 two, and also a 2-2. Two, two. When I'm summoned, if I was created, draw 1 and grant me plus 2, plus 1. Now, I think this is one of the most interesting cards we've seen. Because when it comes to this sort of like, you know, if I was created thing, especially when it comes to the things like, obviously you're thinking about uh, iterative or counterfeit copies or imp like cloning imperfectionist. This is a good payoff. This is a great design for a card. 
because a lot of the times when you're creating or shuffling cards back in your deck they're they're like bad draws right uh, when we look at the cards that we wanted to clone things like time bomb things like hexite crystal those had either draw like the time bomb or two the hexite crystals which you can just tutor out your deck with predicts right and this falls in the same boat where this because it has a draw um you don't it, it, you don't really care as much about shuffling into your deck and it just comes as a four four stat line for two mana like that's really good like that's a good that's a fantastic target to clone Especially if you think about it, if you play with Victor, you can be playing this for one mana, right? Like these are like messengers on a stick, but potentially better. And even if you just play out the first one, it's just a two mana, two, three, right? Like, yeah, if you want to play like two or three in your deck because you need to clone them and then they're not created, there's still two mana, two, threes that have like a pretty high upside to it. I think this is a very interesting build around. And I think would go great in most of the cloning decks just as additional options if you have like a like a cloning perfect evil imperfectionist and you just don't have like any of the cards you want to clone yet but you draw a cunning kitten right so i think it's actually pretty good i will give this a three star rating uh, next up caustic riff three mana fast speed flow i cost one less deal one to all enemies in pnz this card is kind of ridiculous in my opinion um i don't know why <laughs> Um, obviously if you flow it you can double with seraphine but it's just pnz deal one to all enemies pnz isn't supposed to have aoe that's like one of the weaknesses to pnz so i could i would play this card at three mana too like i don't like if you play this card at two mana fantastic if you play this card at three mana it's just like ice shard but better for pnz right like this card's ridiculous like you can and i think one of the upsides again to having extra removal cards that are good that you want to play in your deck is the fact that you have more cards to play with Seraphine. So that either means that you have more cards to double up after Seraphine levels up, or you have more cards to enable Seraphine's level up faster. So the idea of this card is super insane, right? So I'm going to give this a four star rating. It's fantastic, fantastic card. I have the god two mana equipment in Bilgewater doesn't give any stats, but on attack, it spawns two. Mm, okay th let's talk um two mana the earliest you can play it is on like turn three what i think could be like pretty okay like you play like you play the three drop and then you put this on the three drop that summons an attacking or summon or like spawns but the issue is if you don't have a tentacle it's just going onto the bench right and you're not going to be summoning an attacking tentacle so like to get good value out of this card you want to have an a tentacle attacking you play the one drop, you play the idol, and you play the three drop, then you play this on like the three drop. You could play this on the tentacle, which I think is hilarious because it just buffs itself by two. But I just don't know if that's very good. I, this isn't the card that's going to save Alawi, that's for sure. So I can say two star rating. Oh my god, we have so many more cards. All right, need to hurry this up. Um, three mana, one three Bilgewater elusive unit, the Wily Newtfish, super cute card. Next to strike, draw one, and give it fleeting. All right, let's talk. I think this card isn't as good as it seems because it is drawing fleeting. Um, as a three mana one three elusive, it's not very good stat lines. It's not like Ezreal where you know it's gonna level up and end the game, and but sometimes you can play it early to get Mystic Shot and use it as removal, right? You're drawing a card from your deck and you're giving it fleeting, which means that if you're playing this card on turn three, right? Say you're tagged on turn three and you're playing this on turn three, you spend all of your unit mana, and then do you even want to strike to? draw a card that you probably can't play you probably don't like if you compare this card to a card like pick a card the reason why pick a card is a lot better is not only is it drawing multiple cards you're drawing on the next turn where you have the ability to just spend all your mana to play out those cards if you want to right you get that option to sort of burn them if you don't want to but at least you have full mana to play it and in this case if you place on turn three and then you don't want to attack with it then and or or you're like your opponent has elusives like Oh, this this card is just not that great. I will give this a one star rating. I just don't think it's very good. All right, we're finally getting to the Kale cards. We have the Seraphic Wyvern, a four mana three five dragon with theory that says Empowered Overwhelm or Empowered Five Overwhelm. I think when it comes to these empowered units, this one's actually pretty decent because it has theory itself, right? It can grow by itself. It kills two units. It gets Overwhelm. 
And that's pretty decent, especially because it's a 3-5 stat line, right? Which is very, very strong. A lot better than 4-4s, four in my opinion. Um, and you can buff this and it gets overwhelm. Like, buffing and getting overwhelm is quite good. You don't have to, like, play, like, the dragons, the 3-mana dragon egg, the dragon... You know what I'm talking about. The one that grants your dragons overwhelm. Now, the obvious downside in Powered is that if it gets, like, Troll Chant or whatever, it just like, doesn't get overwhelm. Which I think is like, really funny when it comes to, like, play arounds for this, but overall, I think this is just a decent card. I'm going to give this a 3.5 star rating. Next up, Lawkeeper, 6 mana, 2, 7. Sorry, these are, both tar these are all Tarion cards. But Lawkeeper, on play, stun enemies with less power than me. Oh, I thought about a hilarious comp with this. But nonetheless, so if it has two attack, it's stunning all one attack enemies, right? Which isn't very good, obviously. Um, you can buff this card with a card like Purifying Flame to give it plus three, plus three. And if it has five attack, it's stunning all units that have less than or four less power, right? Which all of a sudden is intimidating more on a stick. All of a sudden, a lot better. If it has six attack, I think that five threshold is so, so big. This card just like stuns your entire opponent's board, right? And it just comes on a body. I think you have some really funny synergies with this card, right? You can play this card with things that boost its power on summon. Things like um, you have the Shrima card, uh, the 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 um the the four mana three four. You know that gives all allies plus three, plus two, plus three power if your champion is leveled up. Um, I think it's plus two. Or like Azir, right? Azir just gives it one attack on summon. You have cards that can boost its attack on when it's summoned, and then it'll summon, it'll get, it'll put the skull on stack, and then it will like get the power, right? So you can sort of go, 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 like work around this. You can buff it in hand with some of the KO cards. If you get this, or if you get this guy's power to six, I think this could just be a solid game finisher by itself. If you can get this card to 6 power by any means, as long as you're not losing the game, I think this card could be absolutely crazy. Because this ability is just so powerful. Like, no one knows how powerful like these sun effects are. Um, or I think people just heavily underrate how powerful these sun effects are. I want to give this a... I want to give... I'm, I'm probably going to give this a higher rating than I think most people will give it credit for. But it is very... It is like... <laughs> you do have to like do something very specific. And depending on how well your deck can do that thing specifically good, well, it's going to depend, right? So I'll give this card a 3.5 stars. But I think it has such high upside or such high potential. The hero aspect of justice. 5 mana 1-1 one, one in Targon. Um, round end. Grant all allies in play and in hand plus 1 plus 1. So that can like boost your law keeper. But on Empowered 5, Elusive, Lifesteal, and Overwhelm. God damn. Now obviously it's a 1-1, one, one, so it's relying on you to be able to buff it either in hand. And this can buff itself, so or it can buff you know another Mahir in hand. So this can just grow infinitely, right? Given time. And if you get the students empowered thing, all of a sudden it's elusive. Your opponent can't block it or has lifesteal and it just heals you back, right? Uh, again, it really depends on how well you can buff your units in hand. And in this case, because it has, only has one health, unlike Lawkeeper, you also do need to buff its health in addition to its attack, right? So a lot more specific all by itself. This is a very, very solid engine card. I just don't know if... Uh, Given our card pool right now, we just don't really have all that many buffs for it. So I do think that this can be removed pretty easily. And if you're spending five mana on something that can be removed pretty easily, I don't think that's quite good enough. I mean, if it's a 3-3 when it comes down, that might be good enough. But again, it is very... You know, if it's a 3-3 and it sticks, then it just like snowballs the game, right? Oh man, that's tough. I'll give this 3.5 stars as well because I think this has super again super high potential super high snowball ability next up divine judgment six mana burst speed spell this is also kale spell um give an ally I can't take damage or die this round give all allies plus one plus so this round so this is two things right it gives allies plus one plus so so it enables empowered and it also just acts as a pseudo deny slash bastion ish kind of effect, right? And it's at burst speed, right? So it can't be stopped. But I think it's insane. It's insane, insane, insane. 
The only downside to this card is it can be hushed off the unit, right? But it beats Vengeance. It it potentially beats instances where Bastion doesn't even beat it. So like your opponent has Vengeance file fees. Like this card is so insane because it's burst speed, right? Granted, it's only for the round. You have some really hilarious things you can do. You can play this with like out, go get it. Or sorry, is it out of the way? Whatever that makes like a buff permanent, right? Is that insane? <laughs> that would be really hilarious. Like you play out of the way. And then you play like, you know, these, like the, you know, when you, not only does it give this effect permanently, also gives this plus one effect permanently as well, right? Is that like too funny? I think that scenario is too funny. But because it's Kale spell, right? Because it's Kale spell, you don't even have to main deck this card to have effect for it. And I think this card's, you know, on, on, on a build, you can probably main this card. Because it's it's this this is one of the most powerful effects to stop something from dying. Um, it, it doesn't stop obliterates, which deny can, which is unfortunate. It doesn't stop silences, which denies sometimes can. Um, but I think this card's really good. I think this is easily four stars. Next up, winged messenger, a three mana two four on empowered elusive. Again, one more thing to think about when you're think looking at all these Targon empowered units is the fact that Targon has a lot of these buffs, right? You have Esmus, you have Dark and Lodestone, you have gems from Mountain Goat, you have like Mentor Stones, right? You have a lot of cards that permanently grant one power. So if you're looking at this card where it's two to three, that's very easy to enable. You can just go Esmus into Winged Messenger. All of a sudden, you have a three, five elusive. And that's really good. Maybe like maybe this isn't the card that's gonna like pressure down your opponent, but at the very least you're dealing chip, and this is a fantastic elusive blocker by itself, right? Between these cards, I think this one is going to be one of the more solid ones, not only because it's cheaper, but because I think a loose blocking loose is very good and has a good stat line, right? I think this card's easily again four star card. Purifying flames, four mana burst speed targon spell. Grant an ally in hand plus three plus three and another plus two plus two. So on the on the terms of this empowered archetype, this is one of the enabling cards to it. Now the condition of this card is that it only grants allies in hand these stats, right? If you look at a card and very similar cards that's been played a bunch, um, which is battle bonds, it's five mana burst, give grant two allies plus two plus two. And this card is giving plus one plus one extra stats for one less mana, but it's only in hand which means that you have to set this up. You have to draw this before you want to play the unit you want to buff. And you don't have the reactivity to buff something to protect it, right? So I think when it comes to like these buffing spells, it doesn't buff enough for its cost to justify this. It's not giving you a game-winning unit. And this, uh, this buff is slow. Like, I would much rather play a Yun on turn 4 and then play Battle Bonds on turn 5 versus playing this on turn 4 and the Yun on turn 5, right? Not only do I have extra reactivity, I also just get the unit down earlier. And this card is sort of the opposite too without giving it enough of an upside for me. So I don't think this card's very good. Now, this might be necessary to enable things like Mahira or Lawkeeper, so I think the power level of this card is a lot more dependent on the overall power level of the Empowered cards, especially Mahira and some other things. But overall, I can't really be too positive about this card. I want to give it a 2.5 star rating. Alright, Kale. Kale, Kale, Kale. I did talk about Kale a decent amount in my video on her. I think she's pretty fantastic when it comes to just being a, like a game ender because she gets overwhelmed and quick attack by herself. She turns into a Divine Judgment, which can use, be used to protect her. And so she inherently has protection. She's in Targon that has extra protection. Um, she has this effect that scales herself. And I don't think she's super hard to level up. I think I'm not certain about that, but because she can like level herself up, if you have like a five wide board, she's just flipping by herself, right? Um, granted, this is a round start, so the earliest you can actually level Kale is turn seven. Um, and then like you're attacking on like turn eight and then ending the game, like that's not that's not bad. Uh, there are gonna be faster champions. Um, 
and maybe that might push Kale out too slow. But I, because Kale comes with Divine Judgment as her chance spell, I think that's going to give me a little bit extra boost in confidence, especially because I think Kale also enables Zelani, which we'll cover very shortly afterwards. But I think Kale and her package and just the ability to also just grant allies plus one plus one plus oh, and then grant them again when she levels is just good stats. And then be obviously when it comes empowered, Kale's there to provide, right? So I'm gonna give Kale a four star rating. I don't think she's in I don't think she's Seraphine level or Vein level when it comes to these cards, but overall I still think she's quite strong. So uh, four stars. Next up, Zelani the Bloodweaver, 7 mana, 2-2 two, two overwhelm, I have plus 2, plus 2 for each ally that died with its power increase. So that, and that's where I think Kale really ties into it, because when Zelani is empowered 16, so she has plus, plus 2 for every ally. Um, and then you can obviously buff Zelani, and this is just instant, right? It's not turn end or whatever, or round end, round start. Once she has 16 power, I have plus 2, plus 2, and then attack, transform, attacking non darkened followers into exact copies of me. So you're transforming anything, any follower that's not a darkened into something that has 16 power and overwhelm, right? Like this is, this is a game finisher. <laughs> there's, abs there's almost absolutely nothing that can stop Zelani if she attacks empowered, right? And because Kale uh, enables this, because you can just buff this, and because it's instant, like this is a fantastic finisher if Kale can't like, if, if they remove Kale somehow, right? Heaven forbid. Um, or you just like <laughs> divine judgment on Zelani and then they can't kill and then you just kill your opponent. And it's because of exact copies, it just copies the divine judgment effect too. Like, god damn, dude, that's so good if you pull it off. It might be unnecessary because Kale might just end the game. But having additional threats reminds me very like reminds me a lot of like Pantheon decks, right? They just like play threat after threat after threat that you need to deal with. And this one comes down pretty beefy. I think this is a I think this has a very high potential. Like this is a lot better than I feel like this could be better than if you guys remember like uh when Kaiza and the eight drop I forgot the name of it um came out like that was a really good finish but this is on turn seven this is even faster oh my god I think this can like end games on turn seven if you draw it I really do think it has that potential so I'm gonna give this four stars as well divine clerk one mana two one empowered three life steal i think I, again when it comes to life or empowered cards especially when it's only plus one this is fantastic right you can pale cascade divine clerk and then it's gonna be a three two with life steal and like, that's really important for targon because targon mid-range decks historically just lack healing cards or ways to just like really sort of stabilize against aggressive decks right and all of a sudden you just have this ability to just have a one mana unit that is a two one that already blocks and sometimes get life steal a fantastic card, four stars. Blood Steel Blessing, a two mana burst speed Targon card, grant an ally in play and an ally in hand, plus one, plus one. So this is like Pale Cascade without the draw, but grants and also gives an ally, or grants an ally plus one, plus one in hand, right? Which for this Empire deck, I think is very, very solid. This enables the Divine Cleric, this enables the Winged Messenger, and then it also gives an ally in hand, plus one, plus one. And they're, they're more, more importantly, they're grants, right? You lose the draw, but I think this is fantastic. So, four stars. All right, last 10 cards. Let's try to breeze through these ones. Holy. Rock Bear Shepherd, three mana, one, three, Shreeman Follower. When you summon an ally, advance your highest countdown landmark one round. When I'm summoned, summon a hibernating Rock Bear. Hibernating Rock Bear is the, four, is the two mana landmark with countdown four. Summon a five, five. This card seems interesting because I don't... You're not playing this card to like speed up your thralls or your sun disc, right? That's not what this card is doing. You can do that, but it's just unnecessary and there's better options. So when it comes down to what is this card doing, that's my biggest question. Let's hypothetically assume that it's there to just speed up your high main rock bear. So you play this on three, you have the countdown to three on turn four, you summon two allies maybe. Uh, and it has to be allies, right? It's not when you summon, like, you know, a landmark, right? So, maybe you're getting rock, the rock bear out on turn 5. Well, let's say you get the rock bear out on turn 5. Is that good? I don't know. Like, if, if you're playing Taleo, this kind of thing, you just rather play Solid Spire. 
granted this card might just like be that sort of like segue into your solid spire turn or maybe you can use it to lead a copy of the high rock bear and then you may you don't get the stat boost but at least you get like some effect out of it but specifically for like Talia Landmark or Talia Malphite, Saltzfire was a 4 mana landmark. This is only a 2 mana landmark. It's not leveling up your Malphite, but potentially it might like just segue your way through. Outside of specifically the sort of like mid-range landmark deck, even like Talia Ziggs, is this card good? Maybe it's okay, but I'm comparing this card to like the Ruined Acolyte. No, not Ruined Acolyte, but the 3-3, three, the three, three, right? The, with the Death Rattle. And that's some of the better landmark this this is an engine which if it survives long enough it can get additional value uh and then i guess the rocker itself also counts as a summon so disc or it'll count on another landmark i don't think there's enough landmarks to actually benefit from this card like maybe you're using this in like some catalog funny deck maybe it's good enough in just like this talia ziggs mid-range deck but there's, you already have the three drop the three three right and that one actually like trades which is a lot more important for mid-range it's cool to have engine cards, but in mid-range decks where you really rely on having units to like or sort of block or trade, that doesn't really do it. So I'll give this card a 2.5 star card. Acolyte's Reliquary, 1 mana landmark. In Shrima, when I'm summoned, create a ruinous Acolyte in hand, which is the 2-1 overwhelm. I, I believe it has overwhelm. I hope it has overwhelm. And it scales for every ruinous Acolyte you have played. When you destroy me, create an Acolyte's Reliquary, which is landmark in the top 5 cards of your deck. So again, I, I just, they really, really like this Ruinous Acolyte archetype that has never, ever, ever seen play. Does this card make it better? No. One star. All right, Voidgate. Two mana, Shreeman, Landmark. When you summon an ally or an ally dies, grant each of its positive keywords to three allies in your deck. I talked about this card a little bit when I first did this reveal, review, and this card's really, really interesting. Like, this is super insane when it comes to engines. Like if you play, uh, and 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 I saw on Twitter, um, someone clarify this interaction with Husk, right? Let's say you're playing Evelyn, you summon the Husk, this will count it, give the Husk keyword to three positive allies. You play a unit, the Husk dies again, it'll give the unit a keywords back. The ally gains the keywords, um, so you're summoning an ally with the keywords, so it's going to give the keywords back again, and then that ally dies. And then you get the keywords back in. So essentially, you're give you're proccing. If you play husk, kill the husk, and then the unit with the husk dies. You're proccing void gate four times. There's a very high potential out of all the engine cards I've seen. I think this one has the highest potential to be very very snowbally, very very toxic, and very game winning. The only problem with this card is the same problem with a card like Reaver's Row, where if you don't play this on turn two. This card is for sure terrible. And there's still some clarification whether or not I can give the keywords to the same ally or even give the keywords to a, you know, like a unit that already has the keywords. If it can, it's going to be worse as well. But because this engine has to be drawn early, like Altar of Blood, like, like um, Reaver's Row, it just inherently isn't that good. But I think this has the highest potential. If you draw on turn two, you're doing very powerful things. I'm going to give this a 2.5 star card or rating. Champion Strength, 8 mana, Demacia, slow speed spell. Give your allies plus 4 this round. If you have the attack token, give them Scout. Otherwise, Rally. So this is Rally plus big buff on the stick, right? And I think this card's really good. Giving Scout is essentially a Rally. Um, but you don't use you don't have to attack first, right? So you're getting the buff first, and then you're getting two attacks, or you're getting the buff, and then you're getting a rally, right? Like the power level of this card is really good. The only downside is, well, <laughs> they're bundled together automatically, right? It's not like you're paying four men to rally because that's all you need. You have to play this for eight mana, but. This just becomes a better finisher card for more mid-range decks. This obviously doesn't benefit the aggro decks that would love to have a 4-mana rally, but this can definitely benefit some of the more go-wide decks, or even, like, you can place as early as turn 5 if you have a wide board and it's your attack turn, right? Like, you can think about this card like Yordle and Arms, but it's just infinitely better, almost. It doesn't have a condition, gives more stats, 
and it comes to the rally. Like, it's so efficient. And I think this card can be super scary if you have a white board, right? Um, I think this card is potentially game breaking. I'll give this a 4.5 star rating, maybe even a 5. Uh, this card is probably just that insane. Petrocyte Charger, 3 mana, formidable, 0 4. I don't take damage from enemy spells or skills. Cool story, homie. 1.5 stars. Rusty Ram Hound, 1 mana, 1 1 elite. The first time you summon another elite, grant me plus 2 plus 2. So it has potential to be a 1 mana 3 3, but it comes down as 1 mana 1 1. Um, it is an elite itself, so it can discount Vanguard Squire, which is pretty good. Like you play three of these into Vanguard Squire on turn two, and then you have four three threes on board. That's pretty funny. Like imagine that high roll. Um, for elite decks, I think this one's not bad. Again, the issue with this card is when you play on turn one, it doesn't do anything. And that can sometimes be a crutch because sometimes you want a two two to trade into your opponent's unit, right? So that in by itself makes it a lot worse. It feels like a it feels like a two two that gained pl granted plus one plus one instantly better. Um, but this version is just slightly worse. It, it has a fantastic card art if you guys should open it when you have time. But elite archetype again, you're not playing this in any archetype that isn't elites because you need the consistency of buffing this. Is this card helping elites? No, not maybe. But is elites good? No. Um, I'll give this a, I'll also give it a three star rating because I think it's actually pretty good in elite deck, but it has downsides to it, and elites aren't that great. Four of Akathia, six mana, slow speed, Damasia card, summon two Akathia Mirages, equipped with up to two equipments in your hand that cost two or less. Is this card good? Akathia Mirages are the three twos, and they get to equip two weapons. I don't think this card is actually very good. Um, because let's compare this card to like the four mana card, right? The one that discards a weapon to draw two and then summons a Kathy Mirage at burst speed. So you're getting a three two, but you're not, you're getting two three twos, you're getting two equipments. But is that, I don't like, is that very good? It's like, it's like, uh, it's like, um, it's like a assembly line, right? But they, they potentially equip equipment. You have extra equipment in hand. I think there are better ways of utilizing them than something like this. This you might be able to happy to generate this card and then you just have equipments in hands like cool beans. But I don't really see too much value in this card. I'm gonna give this two stars. Alright, Deathless Knight, six mana five five fearsome when I would gain ephemeral Grammy plus one plus one instead. Now this is an interesting card because this can never get get ephemeral, right? Or I mean you can force ephemeral onto it, but it's never a downside, right? You can play cards like Mark of the Isles, you can play Song of the Isles, you can play Fading Memories, Fading Icon, um, I mean Fading Memories, you can play Stalking Shadows, you can you can play like the new landmark card, the Black Flame, Winds, Twin Wind Technique, right? Like you have a lot of synergy cards with it to like just summon extra copies of this card and because it never gets ephemeral, it just turns into a 6-6 instead, right? Now is an infinite 6-6 good? With like high deck building costs and high costs itself, probably not. But I think this is really hilarious and obviously also very snowbally. So I'll give this a 2.5 star rating because I think it's hilarious. I would love to see some sort of like Black Knight, Black Flame, or Deathless Knight, Black Flame combo. I think that'd be really funny if your opponent can't deal with it. And it just like kind of steamrolls your opponent. But it's a little bit too niche, a little bit too cute, too slow for ephemeral archetypes. And yeah. Alright, Shape of Fear, 1 mana, Shadow Isles, Fast Speed, Kill an Ally to Summon Encroaching Mist. That's interesting, because it's, it's, it's two things, right? One, it's Viego support. It kills an ally, so it's giving you a proc for Viego potentially, or it gives you extra progress towards Viego. It's also summoning Encroaching Mist, which is, again, doing more for Viego. If you have Viego on board, and then you play this, you summon two Mists, you kill an ally, you have the potential to flip Viego the instant turn you play it, right? Which I think sort of makes up for the fact that Viego's a little bit slower being at 6 mana now, right? And because you have this card to kind of speed things up. But what I think this card also has is a really cool synergy in a more aggressive sort of kill your own unit archetype, right? Like, 
uh, encroach like the Chemvorn soldier, the three through is already fringe. I think I think very fringe and aggressive archetypes. But the issue with that is you can only play three of them. So at most your miss was like a two two or three three, right? But the shape of fear potentially making extra mists. Um, like Chemvorn soldier all of a sudden becomes a lot better as an aggressive card. And I think that this has decent potential, but I don't know if it has enough. I think it's really cute. I think there's some really interesting aggressive things you can do with it. And I think it has pretty decent synergy with Viego itself. So I really want to give this card a 3.5 star card. I, I think that I think pretty highly of this card. I think this is pretty cool. Alright, last card. Two mana, two, two redeemed prodigy in Shadow Isles, a unit that says attack, summon, and attacking ghastly band, which is the two on ephemeral hollowed unit, right? This card is interesting because again, ephemeral support, you know, on a stick, it's like Zed, but without quick attack, but summons a ghastly band. Um, obvious downside of this card is you need to attack with this card, unlike the the landmark. The good side is it's a two drop, so it comes on a turn earlier, and sometimes you get two attacks with it, and you get two procs. This card by itself is not bad, you know, if you trade with it, I think that's not probably not good enough because you just have the three one that you can trade with anyways, that has hollowed. So you really want to get an attack out of this card. If you're holding this back just to attack with it, you don't block and then it dies. I don't think that's good enough. This card seems a little bit awkward. I love the, I love this card though. It's the uh it's the tortured prodigy redeemed through Gwen. But I just don't think this card's good enough. It's not one your allies attack, it's one I attack. And I think for hollow decks there are much better options. I'll give this a two star rating. But that is all 69 cards reviewed for this set. Oh my god, that was a lot to go through. I do think that overall, the cards from this set, I will say, are weaker. Or slightly weaker than the Seraphine Vein patch. Which I think is going to be interesting to see how it shaped out. I think there are some decent cards and maybe I'm underrating some cards. But I, don't, I really didn't give many 5 star ratings to many cards. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see. Having darkened weapons, I'm very curious about Aatrox, very curious about Rise, and very curious about how everything's going to shape out. So very excited for tomorrow to get a chance to play around with new cards. Let me know what you guys are wanting to enjoy or wanting to play when cards come out. Let me guys know if you disagree or agree with any of the cards that I've rated today. But I appreciate y'all for hanging around, and I hope this was interesting, fun, or exciting. And I'll see you guys later. Peace out, guys. Take care.